Get ready for another episode of Prairie Sportsman. Join us as we head out on an exciting fall muskie fishing adventure in West Central Minnesota. Plus, we'll take a closer look at the research being done to combat aquatic invasive species and protect our waterways. And we'll join Nicole Zempel for a fast forage. Hey, it's Brett Amundsen. Welcome to Prairie Sportsman. We got another great show for you starting right now. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, and by Mark and Margaret yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farm, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org, and by Live Wide Open, Western Minnesota Prairie Waters and the members of Pioneer PBS. Forty-eight degrees this morning as we get up. We're meeting Rand and Olson at the lake. We did this a couple of years ago uh, around this time of year. I think it was about a week earlier or so, but if I remember right, it was actually colder in the morning. I think it was 30s when we drove up to meet Randon last time. He fished yesterday, they caught a couple of fish, so uh, we're looking forward to it. Could be a pretty good day, it's muskie fishing, so you never really know. I haven't caught a muskie in a long time. Dan, have you ever caught a muskie? Dan's never caught one, so we're gonna try to get Dan his first muskie, uh, see if I can catch a uh, first one in a long time. I've never, caught, I've never caught one over 40 inches, so it'd be nice to catch a 40 and uh, see if we can have a little bit of fun on a late September day musky fishing. We're going to drag a couple suckers and we're going to cast as well. Yesterday they were eating the suckers. They weren't moving a lot in the casting, but we were, our water temp, we dropped another two degrees overnight, so I think that's gonna help. Cold fronts are always good in the fall. So we got two suckers behind the boat, some giant bobbers. How does this setup work? So obviously there's three of us out here. We're gonna have one guy casting, kind of bringing fish up, covering the flats. And the suckers, we're running it down the weed edge. So these are set up with quick strike rigs. So we got a nose hook, and then we got two trebles in the back. And the way this will work is, is you wanna set the hook quickly, but you also wanna get in the right position. So once one goes off, We'll pull the others up and we'll turn the boat and we'll chase that sucker down. We'll get right over top of that bobber so we got short line and we can kind of manage what the fish is doing. So we want it to head away from us and then you're gonna give one heck of a hook set and hang on. What are we throwing? That is a Medusa. I call it killer. This is responsible for a lot of muskies over the years. It's actually the third one. This was one of the other ones. We lost a tail on it yesterday. So there, there's, I got three of the same bait. Uh, these are Medusas, it's a, it's a kind of a rubber bait, like a bulldog, anything like that. And it's just gonna be a jerk, reel to slack, jerk, reel to slack. Um, it really imitates a good dying fish. While I was casting up front, Randon was in the back monitoring the suckers on the Garmin Livescope, which allowed him to see if and when muskies would come check out the bait in real time. Quick look, oh, it's coming back up. That's so neat. Just eat it. Come on. It is looking. Just eat it. There he just turned. Coming up to look at him. so cool watching them swim up like that. Just eat it. It's awesome and frustrating at the exact same time. <laughs> After being teased, we finally got a taker. Yep. <clears throat> Here we go. We've seen four, I think, so far. <clears throat> okay, so when you do set the hook, 
You're gonna set it like you've never set a hook before. I don't know, that bobber stopped moving. That's Unless okay. We're coming back to it, I suppose, huh? Harry's starting to move again. Should I close her up then? Yep, kind of manage it. I want you to keep a little bit of slack. Yep, there you go. And what we'll do when we get close is we're just gonna kind of lift a little bit. The idea here is to get them going away from us and you're gonna set it like you've, you're trying to break the rod. All right. Go ahead and just kind of lift up on them a little. Okay. You feel them? Yeah. I want you to reel down into them. Okay. Keep going, go, 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 reel till you start to feel it real heavy. Hit it. Oh. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> 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 well, I gave her. I gave Keep her. Keep reeling. He's still on there. Here, I'll hold this. <laughs> Maybe. Let me know if you need a third set of hands here. There he is, right there. All right. <laughs> See chaos. Oh, this will work. This should work. We get him? We got him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about your rod. That's just fine. <laughs> yes. That's, that's a, awesome. That's a good one, too. <laughs> <laughs> what did you tell me about setting the hook, Randon? I wanted you to break the rod. And you're going to set it like you've, you're trying to break the rod. Oh. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Good job. Yeah. That's a good fish, too. Nice. First muskie in a long time, Randon. Thank you very much. That was a fun fish to catch. And doing it that way, there's so much anticipation of that hook set. I might have gave her a little extra. It's okay. <laughs> but you said to give her a little extra. So 43 inch fish, that was awesome. And it's real early in the day. Yeah. Let's get some more. Yeah, it's beautiful fish. With one fish in the boat, we decided to record an interview with Randon for the podcast Dan and I do called Sporting Journal Radio. And we were in for a little surprise. Then last time we tried to time it with the moon, the, mm -hmm. with the moon phase, and then we were playing the majors and minors, and we noticed that fish. Oh, fish. Oh, here we go. All right, Dan. Dan's up. Okay, so you're going to kind of manage the line, okay. but I want you to leave some slack in it. Okay. That makes sense. Yep, so, so right now we're kind of tight. I'm going to get you on this side. Okay. Yep. I don't want you to put much pressure on him. Yep. I would like to get nice and close. There's a good chance when we get close, he's going to go to take off. So just be ready to okay. slack them. Hopefully this isn't a repeat. <laughs> yeah, don't break the rod, Dan. I have no promises. Are you ready? We're going to be getting real close. Okay. okay. Reel down and hit him. Nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Got him. There we go. In the net. <laughs> Med radio show. <laughs> Heck yeah. I love That's it fun. There we go, Dan. First muskie. First muskie. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fun fish. Congratulations. It's not a giant, but they're heavy. They're pretty. Brandon, how many times do you get people their first muskie? A lot. Uh, I've lost count, um, but there's no better thrill for me. I love. I think to be a guide, you gotta like to watch people catch fish, and this is the, this is as good as it gets. Muskies often have feeding windows, and when that window is open, you want to capitalize. And before too long, another fish showed up on the live scope. Come on. He's looking at it. Now. He's going back down now. Nope, coming back. Oh, he's coming hard. Coming he's coming fast. pretty hard. It's hurting you nervous. <laughs> there you go. Sucker's moving now. He might take it. Oh, he's chasing it right with the boat. Oh. There he is. Got it. Got it. <laughs> you just land on one, Randon. 
Unless you want to work the net. Oh, oh no! no. <laughs> that was cool. Well, even the guide misses them sometimes. While we would have loved to have landed that fish, it was encouraging to know our bite window was still open, giving us optimism for one more fish before our day was done. Big one, big one. He's staring at the motor. There he turned on the sucker. That's a big one. Got him, got him, got him. Okay. Who's gonna get him? Can we move up to the front then? Yep. We've got a big one hooked up right now. We're just gonna let him take it. We're gonna get over the top of this fish and slam it. I'll try not to break your rod this time, Randon. fish than last time. Try to put a good hook set into him. Leaned into that fish. That's a nice muskie right there. We caught two early on this morning right away and then ran and missed one. We've had a few other follows and uh, we were actually thinking about packing up and heading, heading for the day. We were just making a plan, and Randon, you spotted this one just swimming behind the boat. He's just staring at the motor. He's looking at the prop on my big motor, just sitting there. I'm like, what? I brought the sucker over there, and it was game over. Yep. Randon just looked at the net and said, it's 47 and a quarter. And what three quarter. 47, 47 and three quarter. Three quarter. Yeah. We were trying to guess how, how long it might be, and I was like, 46? He goes, yeah, probably there. And then he got a better look at it, 47 and three quarter, because... Caught this fish yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Only about a half a mile that way. Well, that tells you something too about how much these fish move around. Yeah. Because a lot of times you'll fish spots or memories or whatever because they don't travel too much, but obviously they travel a little bit. Yeah. And, and he caught it two days in a row? Two days in a row. Get out Th This of is here. probably, and I'd have to look back for sure, but this is probably about the 15th, 16th time I've caught this fish in about four years. <laughs> is, I wish I just, he had a phone, because I could call him and let him know I'm coming out, but apparently he already knows that. That's a fish. That's a great fish. Yeah, underbite, 47 and three quarters. That was a lot of fun to catch. And uh, man, it's been a great day out here, Rand. An unbelievable day of muskie fishing. That's awesome. I appreciate you having us out. Thank you for cooperating. I appreciate you like sending a text message. Yeah, I do, do the best I can for you. Not bad at all. Of course, all the credit goes to Randon for finding the fish and setting us up with the right gear and three muskies in a quick morning of fishing. You can't beat it. And that's why we came back to Ottertail County. So there are a number of different strategies with potential for controlling zebra mussels. Well, number one, the smell of wild garlic is unmistakable. Zebra mussels in and of themselves aren't bad, but the, the way that they change our native ecosystems can be rapid and it can be something that our, our native species never recover from. So there are a number of different strategies with potential for controlling zebra mussels. We are investigating copper because it's one of the more promising methods when copper is in the water, it can be in particulate form or dissolved form. It acts on the gill 
of a, a guild organism. At the guild, there are different ion receptors and copper will compete with sodium to bind to those receptors. And basically to distill it down, it will prevent the uptake of enough sodium for the organism. And so there's all these, it's not, death by copper isn't direct. It's the effect of all of these impacts from like a shortage of different ions. I've been involved in this research since about 2019. This research is funded by the ENRTF, Lake Associations, and other donations. We've done work in Lake Minnetonka, in Hennepin County, and in Pelican Lake in Crow Wing County. Every lake, every body of water is going to have different water chemistry and the unique water chemistry will affect the bioavailability of copper. What we've been doing is measuring the water chemistries of both of those lakes using an EPA model and predicting like what, what the appropriate dose would be for zebra mussel villagers, that's the, the young stage of them, and then testing that concentration as well as some higher and lower concentrations. And we've been doing that both in the lake and in a mobile laboratory. We did a in-lake copper treatment in 2019 that I was involved with down in St. Albans Bay in Lake Minnetonka. And the target concentration there was 60 parts per billion of copper, which is a very low, low concentration. We saw very little survival and very little recruitment of young after that treatment. And sometimes this type of treatment, um, the, the effects of this treatment will result in like a net positive for the lake. And sometimes they might not. And it's important to to look at what those benefits and costs are and probably make a case-by-case -case decision. So if you have copper in the water, it can also affect native species. It can affect fish, different plants, mussels, snails. The concentration is key for that though. It seems like zebra mussels are among the more sensitive of organisms. Zebra mussels are much more sensitive than fish. So it all kind of gets down to, it's like a medication. What's the appropriate dose and what are the potential side effects? Copper-based pesticides are available on the market right now. The challenge with this type of treatment might be getting permission. You need to obtain permits for a copper pesticide type application. A lot of people will buy copper sulfate and sprinkle it off the end of the dock to kill the snails to help prevent swimmers itch. Some of those just off the end of the dock things would not be permitted and, you know, it's hard to control. You can buy it, you can buy it at your local hardware store. You know, it is a chemical. It um, affects all aquatic organisms. And if you just have everyone dumping copper in off the end of their dock, it might not be a big deal this month or this year, but if everyone does it every month, every year, we should, we should probably look into that and talk about it and figure out how to take better care of our lakes. We've been doing copper-based control in aquatic systems for about 100 years. And we've started using copper with zebra mussels. Zebra mussels directly compete with our native mussels. So zebra mussels, unlike our natives, attach to hard surfaces, including the shells of native mussels. They will outcompete them for food, for space, and then they can encrust them so completely that um, they either can't burrow, they can't feed, usually they kill them. They also directly compete with other filter feeders. They can change the amount of particulate matter in the water column, which changes how much light filters through the water. And so that changes the temperature of the water. It changes where plants can grow. 
Um, it changes habitat for fish, for other species. I'm not sure if this is the end all for zebra mussels. I think it's a great potential tool. There are negative impacts or negative effects from zebra mussels and there are negative effects from this type of treatment. We have a lot more to learn, but it, we know that it works. We're just sort of refining how to do it and understand some of the, the potential challenges of an application. The method seems promising. Stories about research into invasive aquatic algae, plants, and animals are sponsored in part by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Wright, Meeker, Yellow Medicine, Laquaparl, Swift, and Big Stone Counties. We can stop aquatic hitchhikers from infesting more lakes and streams by cleaning up everything we pull out of the water. It's a simple drill. Clean in, clean out. Before leaving a water access, clean your boat and water equipment. Remove and dispose of all plants and aquatic species in the trash. Drain water from your boat, ballast tanks, motor, live well, and bait container. Remove drain plugs and keep drain plugs out while transporting equipment. Dispose of unwanted bait in the trash. To keep live bait, drain the water and refill the bait container with bottled or tap water. And if you have been in infested waters, also spray your boat with high pressure water, rinse with very hot water, dry for at least five days. Stop the spread of AIS. What we have here, and it's hard to see, is wild meadow garlic or prairie garlic, a scrumptious edible. The whole plant is edible um, and garlic, right? You use it with everything and anything from the wild you're getting, it's, it might be smaller in size, but it is so rich in that garlic flavor. So wild meadow garlic or prairie garlic, it is native to our prairie lands here in Minnesota. Obviously it's threatened uh, like so many uh, plants due to habitat loss. So I am all about the sustainable harvest of anything from the wild and especially our native plant species. So wild meadow garlic is one of the first things to pop up in the spring. And then by early, early to mid June, that's kind of a good harvest time for it and it's easier to spot than it is now because all the other grasses aren't so tall around it yet. Today, like I said, it's a little harder to, to spot and we are a little bit past prime, you know, harvesting season, but it's also a good time in that it's gone to seed so we can scatter that seed back down. And again, back to the sustainable harvest, I never ever harvest all from the same area stagger that harvest and then I also cut the root tips off and place that back in the ground. Here we have the dried seed head and normally the stem would be green and that is like I said the whole plant is edible and so here you get all the little seeds and we are going to and normally during harvesting time or prime harvesting time and then I just like to scatter that. And so we, uh, when we dig these up, we are as least invasive as what we can possibly be to the soil. I don't dig a big giant hole and yank everything out. I just loosen the soil right underneath where the bulb is going to be. This is a really great example. So for ID purposes. Well, number one, the smell of wild garlic is unmistakable. So you're going to get a very big dose of garlic. And then, well, even right now as the stem, because the stem is normally just a vibrant, bright green. Again, you'll have the new seeds on top and then that opens up and then they'll flower. So you have little white flowers. And they don't all flower, 
but more often than not, I find the ones I find are flowered. So that's um, how to spot them a little bit easier. And again, that's May and early June. And then already we're only into July and you can see they've gone to seed. And so we're just gonna leave those here and scatter them. And then the bulb, that's a good, good garlic smell, earthy garlic. So what I'm gonna do, ID purposes, you can see it's got kind of this little meshy netting, I guess, around it, for lack of any better words to describe this. And so that's a telltale IDing characteristic that you do in fact have wild garlic, aside from, of course, that wonderful smell. And then sustainable harvest, I am going to cut the root tendrils off and I am gonna place that right back into the ground from where it came. And then I, again, leave no trace. And so I'm gonna put the ground back or the soil back as best as I can. And then you can bring this delightful little, little bulb of garlic. It's a little bit different, right, than our commercial garlic, uh, but it packs a wonderful punch and a little goes a very long way. Um, but I like to dry these, uh, the whole entire plant, and then I will grind it up into a garlic powder or of course fresh, right, any dishes that you would use um, garlic in. So there you have it, prairie meadow, wild garlic. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, and by Mark and Margaret yakel Juline on behalf of Shalom Hill Farm, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org, and by Live Wide Open, Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, and the members of Pioneer PBS.